Bonsoir, Marc Poulain. Uh, what about exchange rates, please? Uh, what about exchange rates? Yeah, because I'm not familiar with Bitcoins. And, uh, okay, uh, so Bitcoin works exactly the same way as every other currency works, which means that um, Bitcoin is traded on international markets. It's traded at the moment against probably 35 to 40 different national currencies in real time and directly. Uh, but it's also affected by fluctuations between those currencies indirectly. So it's pretty much exchangeable for anything. Uh, if you can trade into 34 currencies, you can trade those into anything else. The exchange rate is defined by market dynamics, supply demand. Just like, you know, one day you wake up and the British pound is six percent lower. Well, you know, sometimes that happens in Bitcoin too. Actually, um, this year it's been the most um, successful and stable currency. <laughs> Um, so it's, it depends on the time of year you find it. You have to understand that Bitcoin is still a very small currency in terms of the fact that Bitcoin is a global currency from day one, but it's only ten billion dollars in size. Uh, so as a result, it has more volatility than uh, many of the currencies you are used to. So more volatility than the euro. Um, but what we've seen over the last seven years is that gradually the volatility is reduced over time. As it gets bigger, it gets bigger, more stable. I have a question regarding the, one of the most common criticisms of cryptocurrencies. Um, many governments around the world say that you, know, you shouldn't touch cryptocurrencies because they're so volatile. Mm -hmm. And some organizations, uh, some parties have created some sort of solution around it. So they have created your own versions of cryptocurrencies that are tied to or tethered to USD, for example, yes. or to the price of gold, or to the price of silver. Yes. I just want to know your thoughts on these. Are, are these good, bad solutions, or what are they? Very good question. Thank you. So cryptocurrencies are volatile, right? And the reason they're volatile has to do with some very simple physics. Think of um, a cryptocurrency as a boat, right? You want a stable boat, you get on the big boat. You get on a small boat, it's going to be bouncy. Every little wave in the market, then the little boat bounces up and down. Right? Yeah? The ocean liner doesn't move. It takes a very big wave to make that move. Now, it's the US dollar, the ringgit, any other currency. You're looking at an economic base, an economic activity that is in the order of 15 trillion dollars for the US dollar. I don't know how many, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars for the ringgit, with a daily activity in the multiple billion or sometimes sub-trillion dollars of velocity. What that is, is a giant ocean liner, and no wave is going to make that move. International currencies, if they move one percent in a day, every newspaper in the world is talking about it the next day, right? If Bitcoin moves 15 percent in a day, and we go, it's Wednesday. <laughs> Let's see how Thursday works. This is interesting, right? So, um, but the reason is because it's small, and the bigger it gets, the less volatile it gets. In fact, you can see the statistics if you look at the rate of volatility. There's two rates of volatility. You can look at unfiltered volatility, which shows both up and down. Or you can look just at negative volatility, which is periods where it drops too much. Because quite honestly, you know, most of the people in this room were not worried about the last month of volatility, which was like that. Right? It was like <laughs> when the volatility is going like that, nobody's complaining about volatility, right? They're too busy sitting on their calculator and going 2,300 times. <laughs> right? So the point is, volatility has two sides. We, we look econometrically at negative volatility as being the most damaging to people. And you can see, if you look at the last eight years of Bitcoin, over time, volatility has been going down, and negative volatility has been going down uh, even more so. So what does that mean? If you follow that line and you assume that Bitcoin grows and becomes more popular and more mainstream, and it has more daily activity and more people invested and more liquidity and more payments and more transactions and higher value, 
it gets more solid, more stable, and eventually it starts competing. Right now, it's better than 20 currencies in the world. Out of the 194 currencies, probably 20-25 have higher volatility than Bitcoin. That's hard to imagine, right? especially when that's the only currency you can use. Um, and that's very damaging. So over time, it's going to get more and more stable. Here's the problem with tying it to an external asset. And central banks have tried this for decades in various ways. The Argentinians tried it with the peso. Right? Um, the Brazilians tried it with um, four different currencies that no longer exist. That should give you an idea. Um, the Swiss tried to keep it. The euro tried to keep a peg to the dollar for a while. The yuan is still pretending to try to keep a peg to the dollar. Um, and what happens is, if the market wants to go that way and you want to stay here, you start spending money to keep the price stable. And the more the market wants to move, the more difference there is between what you're trying to do and reality, the more expensive the market makes it for you to ignore reality. So the problem with currency pegs is that they can stretch, 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 and then one day they snap. And then you get a 20%, 30% devaluation in a day. When you're doing a peg against U.S. dollars or gold, but the currency you're doing the peg to is tiny, people who know what they're doing are going to take advantage of that. And when they see that the market wants to devalue it, and you're trying not to devalue it, they're going to pour money into that. And if you're dumb enough to try to support the value of your currency, you're going to lose a lot of money. Um, so it's not actually possible to go against market forces. Pegs don't work in the long run. Um, the other thing you can do is you can have a reserve. So you can say, okay, I'm going to take 20 kilograms of gold, I'm going to park them in this vault, and then I'm going to issue currency against those 20 kilograms of gold. We used to have that, the gold standard. Here's the problem. Whenever that's been done in many modern markets, eventually someone goes and does an audit of the vault, and they discover that either the gold isn't there, or that the gold has been sold three times to three different owners who all think they own it, but none of them own it, or they drill into it and it's tungsten painted with gold. <laughs> right? And I'm not joking, these are all specific examples from the gold market just in the last year that you can see. It's called hypothecation. Look at what's happening in China right now, where you have all of these loans that are collateralized against deposits of steel and copper and platinum and aluminum and gold, and they go and do the audit in the warehouse, and the warehouse is empty. Or they ask for the owners to show their certificates, and they find that three people own a single bar of gold. Right? That's the problem. The advantage of cryptocurrencies is if you own Bitcoin, it's on the ledger. Everybody knows you own Bitcoin. Nobody else can make a claim to it, and it's not going anywhere. The problem with tying it with a physical asset is now you have a counterparty risk problem. Counterparty risk meaning the person holding the asset on your behalf can run away with the asset. Remember how I said our entire financial system consists of two parties, the parties who hold your money and the parties watching the parties who hold your money to make sure they don't run away. That's what we're trying to get away from.